morning, West Hills Church. Please stand with us as we open our service in song by singing, Open the Eyes of My Heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you.
his name. He fought for me on Calvary and trembled on the grave. His name is true, King, Lord of together with you this morning. I just have a few quick announcements for you. Uh, if this is your first time with us, welcome. We are very glad to have you. If you could just do one thing and fill out the connect card that's in the bulletin, you can let us know who you are so we can get to know you. You can get to know us. That connect card, as you know, is also how you can submit prayer requests that we put on our prayer list every week and pray for together on Thursday nights. And then after our prayer time at 6 p.m., we have our Bible study through the book of 1 John at 7. And at the same time, over in the fellowship hall, we have our youth ministry uh, where we go through the New City Catechism, which is a series of 52 questions and answers about God and the Bible. And so that's always a great time. So if you know a family with kids, friends, neighbors, invite them. We have something for everyone on Thursday night. On Sunday mornings, we have our main service, of course, and at 9 a.m., we have our ever-growing uh, Bible study through the Book of Romans, our equipping class. I should say that Daniel's been leading us through for the past couple years, and we're continuing on in Romans 14, almost to the end. We've probably just got a couple months or a year left to get through the last two chapters of Romans, but we're almost there. But that class is always expanding. We have new people coming every week. That's always a good time. So if you can come an hour and a half earlier, 9 a.m. every Sunday, that's always a good time over in the fellowship hall. Uh, we take communion together as a church every single Sunday um, to celebrate the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day. And if you did not grab your communion elements when you came in, you can slip to the back now and grab those in the black table. We take those after the next three, we take Sorry, we take communion after the next three songs, um, and that's always a special time. So grab your elements if you didn't get a chance to yet, um, and you can begin preparing your hearts even now for when we come together to worship the Lord through his supper. And finally, if you look inside your bulletin, this Saturday, we've been mentioning it the past few weeks, is our church work day. At 7 a.m., we're going to start more or less uh, this, the, uh, this coming Saturday, August 12th. We're going to start around 7. If you have to come later, if you have to leave early, that's fine. We don't really have a hard ending time. We're just going to wrap up around lunchtime. We have a bunch of different projects. Um, so if you'd like to come out and join us for that, that would be awesome. Lots of different projects. There's something for everybody. A lot of the projects, really simple, cleaning, doesn't require a bunch of manual labor. If you like a bunch of manual labor, if you like painting, we have lots of those types of projects too. So there's something for everybody, and a bunch of us are going to probably go out to lunch somewhere in the area afterwards. So afterwards, if you can stick around, we can all go out to lunch together and have a good time. So that's this coming Saturday. I'd love for you to join us if you can. And now if you'll take your bulletin and stand, Daniel's going to lead us in our corporate scripture reading. Our scripture reading this morning does not come from Psalm 116, 1 through 5. I don't know what the exact scripture reference is here. I'm assuming this is something from 1 Corinthians. In any case, the reference isn't. 
correct, but that's fine. We're going to read the Word of God aloud together anyway. And there's 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, and we're going to read that aloud together. Nothing, in my estimation, is uh, more symbolic of the unity that Christians have together than standing together, reading the Word of God aloud together. So um, let's read from 1 Corinthians. Let's read God's Word aloud together this morning. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with superiority of word or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the witness of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my word and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So reads the word of the one true and living God. Let's go to him now in prayer as we commit our time of worship together to him. Father, we praise you for the glory of the gospel that you saw fit to deliver to us in jars of clay. A glorious message, clothed and robed, even like Christ himself, in humility and in meekness. You've chosen the weak things of the world to shame the wise and the foolish, the strong, and so... As we gather together to worship you, may we be reminded of the glorious reality of the gospel that magnifies your glory and your name and your work. It's not about the messenger or the medium, but it's about the one true and living God. And so may we center our hearts on that today. Father, grant this to us in Christ by the helping power of the Holy Spirit. Now we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's remain standing and continue in song with His mercy is born. What love to remember the wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all knowing, He counts not their sum. Grow into a sea with that bottom.
now with blessed assurance. Oceans in his hands, who has mounted. 
The Lord's Supper is a sacrament of the new covenant, wherein by giving and receiving the bread and the cup according to the appointment of Jesus Christ, his death is demonstrated. And they that worthily partake of it feed, as it were, upon his body and his blood to their spiritual nourishment and growth in grace. They have their union and communion with him confirmed. They testify and renew their thankfulness an engagement to God in their mutual love and fellowship, each with another as members of the same spiritual body. It is required of them that receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper that during the time of the administration of it, with all holy reverence and attention, they wait upon God in that ordinance, diligently observe the sacramental elements and actions, heedfully discern the Lord's body, and affectionately meditate on his death and sufferings, 
and thereby stir themselves up to a vigorous exercise of grace in judging themselves and in sorrowing for sin, in earnest hungering and thirsting after Christ, feeding on him by faith, receiving of his fullness, trusting in his merits, rejoicing in his love, giving thanks for his grace, and renewing of their covenant with God and their love to all the saints. Let us take a few moments now silently to prepare to come to this table in a worthy manner. Our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, as we eat the bread of your flesh and drink the cup of your blood, may you assure us of eternal life. As we partake in this holy meal, assure us of the hope of resurrection. As we eat at your table, may we abide in you and you in us. We pray Christ in your name. Amen. I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that our Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. Let's remember the body of our Lord together. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us remember the blood of our Lord together. Christ, our Passover lamb, we pray that as we partake of this bread and cup, even now, that all their benefits would be applied to us by faith. We pray that you would grant to us to gird our loins and take our staff in hand as we follow you now into the true and better promised land. Likewise, Christ, our living word, we praise you for your written word, which is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. We thank you that it was written down for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. We glorify you for preserving the scriptures pure and complete for us, and we are grateful that you have made them available to us in a language that we understand. Keep us from receiving this bountiful sign of your grace in vain. Thank you for letting our eyes see in the scriptures a light that brings joy to the heart. Amen. Let's take our Bibles out. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And if you do not have a Bible with you, Bibles under the seat, backs in front of you, and also Bibles in the back by the soundboard on the table back there where the communion elements are as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. We'll start reading that in a few moments. And while you're getting ready and getting your notes out and getting set there, I want to encourage you next week to be here at the very beginning. I know some of you have a tradition to be here 10 minutes after the beginning, but we're going to do a new set of uh, songs. Now, if you've been in church for a long time, and if you've been to a church that has done hymns, you will know the songs that we're going to do, but not as we are doing them. The, the melody will be the same, but it's, it's going to be fun, okay? We've, we've done a few extra practices as a worship team and everything to try to pull it off. And of course, I'm going to build it up and do that next week, and then we will just totally blow it. So, but anyway, uh, it actually is pretty fun, and it's a great, 
group of songs, and if you're going to wonder, uh, ask what those songs are, you're going to have to wait until next Sunday, okay? So that's next Sunday, right? We're going to do those right at the beginning at 1030. So I encourage you to be here a few minutes early and be ready for all of the fun that is going to be with that. And uh, on that note, let's jump into our text this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. We read them earlier, but let's take a look at them again. And when I came to you, brethren, I, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Through some interactions that I've been dealing with over the last few weeks, I had found myself reading a website that talked about kind of what, what is going on in the mind of cult leaders, of, of false teachers that are out there who, who make themselves the focus of everything. Now, it's not just cult leaders and false teachers that are like that. I am sure you know people personally that make themselves the focus of everything. Well, I stumbled across this article and it had 50 traits, 50 traits of cult leaders and false teachers. And really the first few were pretty interesting and I think really kind of encompasses the whole thing. First of all, they're preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success and power and their own brilliance. They, they demand blind, unquestioning obedience from their followers. They, they require excessive admiration from their followers and from outsiders. They, they have a sense of entitlement, expecting to be treated special at all times. They exploit people, especially concerning money demanding their money and absolute loyalty. And quite honestly, one of the traits is that they're arrogant. An exaggerated sense of power. And it really enables them to skirt the law or even break it because they feel like they're above the law. Now that's just five or six of the 50 traits of those kinds of individuals. But what you see in the world today, and you saw even during this time, was this concept of hero worship. And hero worship is always going to let you down, especially the cult-like hero worship that goes on today. And what we see here in 1 Corinthians is that God, through the gospel, is going to expose human sinfulness and smush human pride. He, he wants to humble the human race while he saves a multitude from all over the world, from every, different, every tribe, every language, every different background that you can possibly conceive of. He saves from their sin. And in this section in 1 Corinthians, Paul speaks of his own experience in preaching the gospel in Corinth. And he shows them that God was humiliating him and really all humans by the simple act of preaching the gospel of Christ crucified. You see, Paul was not preaching himself. He was not a cult leader. He was not starting a cult. He actually, if you remember in his story, he kind of thought at first he was smushing down a cult until God got a hold of him. His preaching centered around 
preaching of Jesus Christ and, and him crucified and all human wisdom and, and power was, was leveled, was humbled and God's wisdom and power and grace were exalted. Sinners saved by grace. And today we're going to talk about that that is the center of sharing the truth about Jesus. It is all about Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen? Amen. The gospel centers on that. It centers in on the death of Christ. And Paul is reminding them there in the first few verses, 1 and 2, of his approach when he says right there in verse 1, And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with superiority of words or wisdom, proclaiming to you the witness of God. I had determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Those opening words, if you look at your Bible right now, and those opening words of verse 1, where it says, And when I, that can be translated accordingly, base it back on 1 Corinthians 131, accordingly, the glory of God, Paul had not come to Corinth to glorify himself or once again to start a cult or a religious fan club. He'd come to glorify God. And this was a place, and we've mentioned it before, and it's very much like today. You have these itinerant philosophers and teachers that depended on their own wisdom and their own eloquence to gain followers. And the city of Corinth was full of these spellbinding type of people. Paul did not depend on that, on that eloquent speech or, or clever arguments he simply declared God's word in the power of the Spirit. He was an ambassador, not a Christian salesman. Now, could he do that? Could he use the extravagant, spectacular speech and philosophy? Oh, yes, he could. He let people know, hey, I was trained by the best. If you want to go down that road, I could go down that road, but God has told me not to go down that road. Paul never exalted himself. Because if he exalted himself, he'd be hiding the very Christ he came to proclaim. God had sent him to preach the gospel as it said back in verse 17 of chapter 1, not with words, wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Let me give you a picture of that right now in just a little story. There was a church that had a beautiful stained glass window behind the pulpit. Now, these two windows are pretty cool, these two little glass, stained glass windows we have, but they're dinky compared to some, if you've been into some cathedrals and different things like that. So just picture this beautiful stained glass window behind the pulpit. It had depicted Jesus on the cross. And on one Sunday, there was a guest minister there that was much smaller than the regular pastor. And I know that's easy for you to picture right now, a person much smaller than myself. And there was a little girl listening to the preacher for a time. Then, then she turned to her mom and asked, where is the man who normally stands there so we can't see Jesus? Too many people magnify themselves and their gifts that they fail to reveal the glory of Jesus Christ. They stand in the way. Paul is saying, hey, I, I've, I'm glorying in the cross of Christ. In Galatians 6.14, he said this, but it may never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. 
Paul makes it the center of his message. And he goes on. He says, that's what I'm about. That's what I'm preaching. And I'm also going to remind you of my attitude in the next two verses. And I was with you, it says in verse 3, in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my word and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. You see, he was an apostle. He's one of the big dudes. He's one of the called out ones. But Paul came to them as a humble servant. He didn't depend on himself. He became nothing so that Christ might be everything. And in later years after this letter, Paul brought this up again and again and again, contrasting himself to the false teachers that had invaded Corinth and were pumping up who? Themselves. Paul had learned that when he was weak, and what that meant there was that he was not pumping himself up, that he was humbling himself when he was weak, that is when God used him. That's when he was strong. Paul depended on the power of the Holy Spirit. It was not his experience or ability that gave his ministry its power. It was the work of the Spirit of God. He says there this word demonstration. His preaching was a demonstration, and that means if that word actually means legal proof presented in court. In his weakness, in his humbleness, it was this legal proof in court by the Holy Spirit of the Spirit's power to change people, not Paul's. The Holy Spirit used Paul and his preaching to change lives. And that was all the proof Paul needed that his message was from God. Well, what was the proof again? Sinners transformed by the power of God. Not his speech, not his awesomeness. As I would say, the air of awesomeness. Not that. Sinners transformed. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor idolaters, idolaters, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. If you've been around here at all, you know that those of us that are up here that share God's Word have a few different people that we really like from the past, that we study how they preach and how they how they share God's word, uh, men like Charles Spurgeon and George Whitfield. And you know what? They were gifted. They were gifted orators whose word carried power, but they didn't depend on their talents. They trusted the Spirit of God to work in the heart of the hearers. And he did. Those who are believers, those of us that are in the room here that are Christians, we must be prepared to share the truth. We must use every gift God has given us, but we do not put the confidence in ourselves. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, Chapter 3, verse 5, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to consider anything that's coming from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. And so Paul's 
reminding them of his attitude. And he reminds them of his aim. In verse 5, what's the aim? So that your faith would be in the, not in the wisdom of men, but that your faith would be in the power of God. He, he wanted them to trust in God and not in the messenger God sent. Had he depended on human wisdom and presented the plan of salvation as a philosophical system, then the Corinthians would have put their trust in an explanation. But because Paul declared the word of God in the power of God, those who were converted put their faith in a demonstration. They experienced God at work in their own lives. They experienced the transformation, the transformational power of the Holy Spirit to change their lives. Years ago, there was a very wise Christian man who said this, when you are leading people to Christ, Never tell them that they are saved because they have done this or that. It is the job of the Holy Spirit to witness to people that they are saved. Unless He is at work, there is no salvation. And that's wise counsel. Because I'll explain to you how this can play out. True story. There was a young professional who was attending church. He was, he was not saved, but he wasn't against the gospel. He, his, his heart was open. He was listening. Many people were praying for him, and he, as he continued to listen to the word, and he was at church every week. For years. And one day, one of the fellow people at church there, a Christian friend of his, decided, I am going to win this guy to Christ or else. And he spent several hours presenting argument after argument. And finally, the man prayed the sinner's prayer. And then he stopped going to church. Well, why? Well, why was because he had been talked into something that was not real. And he knew that he couldn't follow through with that prayer that wasn't real. He was just saying something to get someone off his back. Now, later on, and the reason I know this story is that later on, he did trust Christ. And through the Spirit, the Spirit gave him assurance of salvation. See, up to that point, if anyone asked him if he were saved, he would say, sure, Tom told me I was. Who do you want to tell you you were saved? The Spirit or some guy named Tom? I, I, I want the Holy Spirit to assure me of salvation you see, the gospel is God's power to change men's lives, to change our lives. Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Spirit is the one that calls, that transforms, that changes. All we are, everyone, we're just like Paul. We're just a messenger, but a very important messenger. You see, effectiveness in this churchy word called evangelism, which simply means sharing the gospel of Christ with those who do not know him, effectiveness in evangelism does not, does not depend on our arguments or persuasive gimmicks. 
It depends completely and totally on the power of God at work in our lives through His Word that we share. That's it. The power of the Spirit at work in our lives using the Word, God's Word, that we share. And this has very simple applications to us then. You see, we've got to focus our minds this week and every week on Christ and on Him crucified. Because that's what Paul's saying. I, I came here and I'm focused on one thing, sharing Christ and Christ crucified. Would you agree that there are a boatload of people around you here in Los Angeles that do not know Jesus yet as their Lord and Savior? Well, if you're a Christian, there's no way around this. That's your mission field. This week. This day. This hour. See, it's not just me as a pastor. We, we have lost people around us everywhere. And most of them don't know they're lost. They just know they don't seem to have hope. And it's our task to tell them about not some great philosophical system that's going to solve every problem our job is to tell them about Jesus. Tell them about Christ. And you need to resolve to be about that all the time as a Christian. We must teach clearly about Jesus and Him crucified in our lives. We must, we, we've got to teach clearly in this church, in West Hills Church, the, the doctrine of the incarnation, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh and born of a virgin and lived a sinless life and did all of these incredible miracles and he walked on water and he fed the 5,000 and he healed disease and sickness among people and he raised the dead. That is Jesus our Lord. And a few weeks ago, when I was in a room just over here with 17 preschoolers sharing the gospel with them, all but three had no clue who Jesus was. Really had no idea. So please remember, the truth is, is most people don't know who Jesus is. We've got to share that. We've got to teach also the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement. What is that? Well, that's Jesus took on a human body so that I, that I may live. Well, why? Well, He took on a human body so that He may die in my place, in your place, he took in himself the wrath of God that we deserved by breaking God's laws. We, we have violated God's laws and we need to teach Christ and him crucified and that he died for us. And it would be wrong for me to then keep going right now if I don't stop right now and apply this to anyone that's in the room. And you may be here today, you came in as someone that is honestly not a Christian yet. You've either been invited to be here by a friend or maybe you're interested somehow. Maybe you just found yourself in church today. May I share with you with all of my heart and reach out to you right now and share with you the fact that you can be reconciled to God through faith in Christ. All you need to do is to believe on Him. 
trust in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died on the cross, who shed his blood, and your sins will be forgiven. You'll be set free. Set free from the chains that have been on your soul, been around your heart. You'll be set free. You'll be forgiven, forgiven of your sins. Yes, past. Yes, present. And yes, future. Not by anything you do, but by faith and by grace in Christ alone. We've got to embrace that. We've got to embrace that fact. We have to embrace the fact, everyone, that without the shedding of blood, Christ's blood specifically, there's no forgiveness of sins. And we cannot shrink back from that. That cross, that bloody cross, the church is always under pressure these days, has always been under pressure to conform to the society around us on this, to give up the cross and just be a bunch of nice people, which, yes, we are called to be loving and nice. Just be nice people. Don't tell me about sin and the cross. But if I really love you, I have to tell you about sin and the cross because otherwise you aren't set free without accepting him. We cannot ever, ever in our lives as Christians give up the awkward and embarrassing offensive message of the cross. It says that in Scripture. So what does this mean for those of us who believe already? Well, it means to prioritize the cross over every issue in life. Now, if you read this, you could go, hey, you know, Paul doesn't know anything else ex about anything except Jesus and the cross. Well, you can't say that. You can, people, I hear people say, well, you know, Paul didn't really know anything about marriage or parenting or money and politics or properly relating to the Roman Empire on different topics and issues of justice. <sighs> He knew all of those things. His letters are filled with those topics. But in this context here, he's saying, well, when I want to see sinners made right with God, I want to know that they're going to be forgiven of their sins. I'm going to focus on the one thing that forgives the sins. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Secondly, I'm going to see all of those topics, all of us in this room. Guess what? Guess what we're going to see in this book? We're going to see about marriage and parenting and money and relating to the Roman Empire on issues of social things and justice. You're going to see all of that, but you're going to see it through what? You're going to see it through the lens of the cross. You're going to see it again in the book of 1 Corinthians over and over. He addresses the very practical issues, but through Christ and through Christ crucified. So that what he means by that, first and foremost, we see the center of evangelism, of sharing the gospel, is preaching Christ and Him crucified. And the product of of evangelism is faith in the power of God. That is the ultimate end of all of this. My message, my preaching were not with wise, persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith may not rest on man's wisdom, but on God's power. So in Corinth, everyone, God uses an un impressive Jewish messenger displaying weakness, fear, trembling, preaching a foolish, offensive message to change their world. Only God could do that then. And so the, for the rest of our lives, we need to be living out the truth of this message. Our entire lives, 
Our witness in this community must follow the same pattern, everyone. The centrality of proclaiming Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The humbling of all human evangelists who are going to go out through the Southern California region this week needs to be done in weakness and fear and much trembling. And you can do that. Trust me, you can be weak. (laughs) You can have fear. You can be trembling. And in that, when you decide to be used by God and let Him use you, guess what happens? Amazing things. So the question is, can you, by the power of the Spirit, share the gospel of Christ and Him crucified? Can you do that? Well, can you? Because the power of the Spirit of God alone is what Paul says works. And the final result, everyone, is people who are converted to the power of the power of God people who are converted and rely on God and not on the presence of a certain person. Not on you. Not on some cult leader. Not on some significant person who found a really cool psychological technique to mess with your brain but on someone who relied on the Spirit and shared the gospel of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's that's what Paul did. That's what we are called to do as well. So let's pray together as we close. Lord, we thank You for this time together this morning. I pray right now that we remember that the gospel centers on the death of Christ, the cross. I pray that we remember that we need to rely on the Holy Spirit, that we need to have an attitude of weakness and fear and trembling to be used by you in the right way. And to always remember the aim. The aim is so that people will have faith in God by the power of God. So Lord, help us to be those people that go out into our world this week in weakness, in fear, and in trembling, and thus in your power, Share the truth of Christ and Him crucified in every action, in every word, led by You, Your Spirit. And it will be amazing to watch how You use that over time. And Lord, I do pray for anyone in the room today that's like, you know what? I've never said yes to believing in Jesus. I pray that they will accept you as Lord and Savior, bow their knee to you and say, yes, you are my Lord. I believe that you died for me. I believe that the cross, the cross set me free. I believe that you took on my sins and I believe you, you conquered them and you rose again once and for all smushing sin in our lives and giving us life. Life with you forever. May we live knowing the power of God found in Christ and the cross. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Let's stand together right now. I want to thank you for being here this morning as we continue our journey through 1 Corinthians. I encourage you right now, if you need to talk with someone or uh, prayer needs, uh, we'll have people up front, we'll have people in back. Love to share some time with you. Remember, uh, prayer requests, uh, offering, all of that can be put in the box that's in the back there by the double doors. And if you're here for the first time, we've got the table out in the foyer where we've got a gift for you, just to say thanks for being here. Remind everyone to invite their friends and neighbors to be here next week and also to be here on Thursday night as well for the uh, Thursday night Bible studies that we have. And just a reminder once again, next, next week we're going to have some fun with some uh, new songs, uh, really old songs done in a new way and, and just a great time in worship together to, uh, next week. So if you have a vacation planned, I really think you need to cancel it. And uh, just be here with us because this is where you need to be anyway, right? Okay, anyway, amen. God bless everyone. We'll see you later. Mm -hmm.